All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Speak Up Newport. My name is Ed Selich. I'm president of Speak Up Newport. And we've got a great program for you tonight. But before we get started, I want to give a shout out to the bungalow. I hope you all had your pre-Thanksgiving dinner tonight. Was it good? Yeah, please, please support the bungalow. They support Speak Up Newport. Uh, so if you have a chance, go have uh, dinner there. And uh, Speak Up Newport really appreciates the support we get from the bungalow. Um, before we get started, we're going to have Q&A at the end of the meeting. So we do Q&A. Please go to the microphone. Don't try and ask the question from your seat. We're being televised and recorded, so we need to have you uh, on the microphone. So, um, oh, one other thing that I wanted to mention. We did announce the uh, date for the annual mayor's dinner. It's February the 29th next year. So you can go on our website, www.speakupnewport.com, to get tickets. Um, it sells out every year, so if you want to be guaranteed a seat, be sure and get in there and uh, make your reservation. So we'll get started with the program to uh, set the stage for our discussion tonight and do introductions to our panel. I want to introduce Robin Grant, Speak Up board member, and well as well a city councilwoman in Newport Beach. Robin. Good evening. Is this on? Good. I'm here tonight to introduce our two speakers. They are Diane Dixon, Assembly Member from the 72nd District, and Wendy Bucknam, Mission Viejo City Council Member. I'll start with Diane, who came to the California State Legislature with real-world business experience after spending 40-plus years in the private sector at a Fortune 300 company. She served two terms on the Newport Beach City Council, from 2014 to 2022, where she also served two terms as our mayor. First elected to the assembly in 2022, Diane is working to create real solutions to California's problems. Among her goals are to reduce taxation, improve public safety, and create greater cooperation between residents, businesses, and government to resolve community problems. Diane's assembly committees include vice chair of local government, appropriations, banking and finance, business and professions, judiciary, and joint fairs allocation and classification. Welcome, Diane. I'll also introduce Wendy. <laughs> Diane. I'll also introduce Wendy Bucknam, and then we'll get started with the program. Wendy was elected to serve as a member of the Mission Viejo City Council in 2014. She also served as mayor in 2017 and 2022. Prior to serving on the council, Wendy served four years on the Mission Viejo Community Services Commission, including one year as chair in 2012. Wendy brings to the community a wealth of practical business experience as well, and a solid record of volunteerism in our schools and youth sports programs. Wendy established the Drug Abuse Prevention Coalition, as well as the newly formed California Sober Living and Recovery Task Force. Welcome, Wendy. Now we'll start with an introduction by Diane Dixon. You can come here if you prefer. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Hi. Welcome, everyone, and good evening. And so many familiar faces. Here we are again talking about sober living homes. <laughs> it's been a regular topic of community conversation for a number of years now as when I was on the city council, but it's great to be back. Ed, it's great to be back. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, and it's great to be here with Wendy Buck Bucknam. Uh, she and I have served together in, in regional uh, uh, positions on ACCOC and OCOG, which is Orange County. I, I tell, I'll tell people OCOG is uh, Orange County Council of Governments is kind of an adjunct subsidiary of SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments, and then ACCOC is Associated Cities of California, Orange County. Pretty much all, nearly all the 34 cities of Orange County are represented on the board, and that's where Wendy and I go back practically to 2014. So when um, I've been involved as when I was on the city council and listening and caring and being concerned with our residents of 
what was going on with the sober living homes and learning more about what we can and cannot do, thanks to our city attorney, Aaron Harp, I should say that. Is there another, is your city attorney here? Is there? Okay, so Aaron, you're the expert. <laughs> you're the legal expert. Um, so we've been dealing with sober living homes and, and I, yes, I did go to Sacramento to help solve community problems and being on local government and being on accountability and what's it called, accountability and administrative review, which I co-chair, uh, Pet Assemblywoman Cotty Petri Norris is the chair, so she and Cotty Petri Norris is still an advocate to help residents on the sober living issues. Since I've been in Sacramento, we've made a few steps forward and then there are a lot of things that are happening as we speak, and I'll get into that in a moment, of what's happening under new state law that has just made our challenges greater. And so the reason why all of you are here, we all know, well, this is a status update. We're all on the same side on this. Wendy and I are on the same side. We support you, the residents in our communities, uh, and we're really up against bureaucracies in Sacramento, uh, with the Department of Social Services as and another department, the Department of Healthcare Services, two different uh, bureaucracies, administrative departments that really control the mental illness side on DSS and then the uh, recovery, sober living on the DHCS. So I've learned a lot being in Sacramento. I'm committed to doing something and I'll talk about what we're doing and as long as it takes. But let me um, just kind of stand back and say, what, is, what, is, what have I been doing and what did I do? So I did find that they're in the coastal cities, at least the Orange County coastal cities, there's tremendous awareness and Wendy's workshop task force has brought South County, South Orange County uh, to the floor. So we are unified on a uh, community basis, on a bipartisan basis, and on a bicameral basis. Uh, many, uh, several Orange County state senators, I know Blake Spear is, in, is supportive, Senator Blake Spear and Cotty Petri Norris, she's uh, still in the assembly. She's very supportive. Katrina Foley as a supervisor. We're all on the same page. Katrina went through this with Costa Mesa. And this is what we've been dealing with, the interpretation of the laws. And going to Sacramento, my goal was to really do two things, uh, two prescriptive changes in existing law. Number one, when I learned at the city level, as hard as we tried, we as a city cannot enforce on a state licensed facility, which is a facility for, uh, for the sober living recovery homes for six beds or fewer. We can enforce for more than six beds. That's, that's within our municipal code. But many of the operators are f realizing that it's better to work under the state system because the local governments can't control it. And the state, in my personal opinion, doesn't enforce adequately enough. So we as a city, I realize in all cities, we cannot enforce state laws. We enforce traffic laws, don't we, Mr. City Attorney? We enforce a lot of state laws. ABC laws, we enforce a lot of, many, many laws, thousands of laws on the books in California. But we cannot enforce on uh, quality of life violations of our municipal code on these homes, sober living homes. And it came to really the apex of concern in our communities when the horrible tragedy occurred up in Santa Ana Heights with the patient of gratitude walked down a few doors and illegally entered a private residence and the private resident uh, in self-defense. Uh, and, and that invader was killed. And so it brought attention as tragic as that was, it did bring in full attention is the risk that homeowners experience living cheek by jowl within 110 feet or 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet from these sober living homes. So I thought my bill, if I get, that's where I'm headed, uh, is to get some data uh, to have a proposed bill and I'll have a lot of co and many co-authors to at least establish enforcement responsibility at the local level. Also a distancing requirement. That seems to be another gap that uh, there's no distancing requirement under sober living recovery homes. So what I've done 
is last spring, March, April, I did get bipartisan support to initiate a, a real audit by the uh, state legislative auditor, the auditor of the state of California. They, the uh, committee chair approved my request, and he's a Democrat, and I'm a Republican. We're working together, approved the request, and so my staff put together the list of questions, and this involved a lot of input from the community and what our experience was of what we wanted answered. The issue with sober living or social rehabilitation, and there are two different definitions, I'll get to social rehabilitation in a moment, is that we, I think we all agree, we want people to get well. If they are in these types of homes, they need to be, if they have a, a, an alcohol or drug addiction, they need to get well. My personal belief is that they're not recovering in these type of homes because I think they lack the medical personnel and the psychological, mental care. It's, I don't believe that they're getting well. And that is really what I'm going after in getting the data with this audit. I, there is no data. I learned this at the city level when we were asking how many people are rehabilitated? How long is the average stay? How many patients go in and out of these homes? There's no data. We need data. Before we can change laws, and before I can introduce a law, there's Council Mem Member Clement, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Before we could presume to change the law or introduce, I need data to show that my hypothesis is that these recovery homes are not helping people to recover from their addictions. So that's where the audit is going. It, is, uh, it was approved by bipartisan, bicameral, by the Senate and the Assembly, unanimously, no problem. A little hiccup occurred about two weeks ago where my staff in Sacramento was informed that there's some crush of business in the auditor's office and they had to take the person that was involved in this particular audit and reduce his or her time, so it's gonna take a little bit longer. When we thought it was gonna be done by, the audit would be completed by May, June, and maybe July. I hope that's still the case. I hope, I don't wanna be skeptical and cynical, because I'm not that way, but I hope it wasn't just an intentional slow walk. Okay, that's just one part dealing with social, rehabil social recovery homes, sober living homes. We have a new little hiccup. And many of you are going to be, all of you will be hearing more about this because it's new law and part of the bond measure to support this new law is going to be on the March ballot, the March primary ballot. As you all know, there's a primary election. It's not in June and then the presidential year, it's in March. I think it's March 2nd or 3rd. $10 billion Mental Health Rehabilitation Act. In the fine print, and, and we're still analyzing this, this was passed literally at 11.59 before we adjourned in September. And they loaded it, I thought it was a $5 billion, became 10 billion when I read the bill the next morning. I asked Katrina Foley, I called her, and I said, did you know this was 10 billion? No, she did not know. And she's been, the county is very much involved in, and I actually voted neutral on the bond measure because the county did not want to take a position because they're concerned that the bond measure of $10 billion is going to re make different requirements or unique requirements that are changing the county's procedures on dealing with mental illness. Now it's including homelessness and social addiction into mental illness. So there's a lot of things being worked out, but the bottom line is it's Proposition 1 on the March ballot. Uh, in the fine print is language that defines a new term, social rehabilitation facility. So this is where Department of Social Services comes into this. And so this is now in law, the governor signed this bill, this separate from the bond measure. The bond measure was passed and it's on the ballot, passed by two thirds. I. I said, voted no all the way through, and then the county said, suggested I be neutral on it. But anyway, I've actually written the bond, the ballot measure statement in opposition to Proposition 1. So you'll be seeing what I said on that. But pro, uh, the social rehabilitation addresses mental illness. So this enables the proliferation and the expansion of social rehabilitation, the mental illness facilities, which is like the gratitude, in any... This is really the key point, ladies and gentlemen. In any residential, residential, commercial, or industrial area. Under the theory, this is the operating theory, and this is really the, the conundrum that we face, is that every person who is in a rehabilitation facility, it's not an institution, they're in a, a, a family-like setting, 
is indeed in entitled to be in a family-like setting during their recovery process. We could have different opinions about that. It's now in law. I voted no on that bill, and I voted neutral on the bond measure, but I oppose the bond measure, as I just said in the ballot statement. So this is our conundrum. I will propose when I get back in January to amend my, uh, the audit or do another audit request to look at social rehabilitation homes and get the data again on how are these people being treated who n desperately need help, the mental illness part of it. So there are, in my opinion, there's, there's a, I'm, there are a lot of problems with both the bill and the bond measure, and it's creating new definitions that, medical, that um, alcohol and drug addiction are now mental illness. I don't think that exists anywhere else in state law. So there are new definitions here. The bottom line is we've got some battles to fight as we go forward. Bottom line is I'm here, and I know Wendy at the local level will talk to you about what she's doing, and we will be working to try to create some definitional issues. My final comment, you could, I'm certainly here for, to answer your questions as we go forward, is we, this is going to be difficult. But it's not without hope. We have to become, all of us, sitting in this room, all of your neighbors must become activists. Must be, and we'll provide this information. Um, I have learned in, uh, many things about how the legislature works in nine months. One thing I learned on public safety, because we all care about public safety, so you may have heard about a bill that was now in law, a good law, SB 14, which enhanced the penalties for child traffickers. Well, that had been defeated in the, uh, in the Assembly Public Safety uh, Committee, and through social media, through press conferences, bringing the victims, the child, adult, they're now adult victims up to Sacramento press conferences, we really shamed the Public Safety Committee that's chaired by a Democrat. They all are, because the Democrats have the supermajority. And he was forced, I think Newsom forced him to rehear this bill. Anyway, it was through public opinion, activists caring for child traffickers. Now, recovery homes are not perhaps on the same level as child traffickers to enhance the three strikes law on child traffickers, so that's been signed into law. That's a good thing. But we still see the value, I see the value, absolutely see the value of citizens, the voice of the people on these measures. The voice of the people really has not been heard. You've been at the local level. We've had here meetings here in Newport Beach. You've had meetings in the community in South County. Everybody is ready to fight, and it really is a fight. We have to be activated, and there are great people in our, in sitting in here tonight. We'll hear from them if they want to ask a question, and in South County, there are people who are activists on this, who are bipartisan. This is not uh, a partisan issue that they're willing to fight. And this is really what it needs to happen before the march. I mean, I personally, um, as I said, I'm going to be in the ballot pamphlet recommending no on Proposition 1. So I can't tell you folks how to vote. But I encourage you that we have to all be activists to protect our communities, but most importantly, to protect the people who really need help. And that really has to be the argument because no one's going to be sympathetic, frankly, to say protect our communities. I know why that's important, of course, but it really, these are not, these are not, these homes, these residential homes are not the places that people who need help who have serious addictions. So the, not, the message tonight is activism, and we'll talk more about that. I'll turn it over to Wendy, and she could talk about what she's been doing, and, and, and on her own volition, realizing the cities in, Orange, in South Orange County Laguna Niguel, Mission Viejo, other cities uh, needed, uh, needed to address this, and the residents are activated as well. If you want to sit there, or you... I'll come back down. You can stay there, or you can come up here, whatever you want. So uh, go ahead. Whatever, whatever is easier for you. We're going to your presentation, or just how do you want to handle your portion? <laughs> okay. All right. So I will join you down there. Oh, okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Bucknam. So probably in Mission Viejo, um, started 
probably similar to what you've experienced. Um, I know that uh, many of the lots in Newport Beach are probably a little different size than the lots in Mission Viejo. But one of the things that happened in Mission Viejo is we have these huge lots, big yards, big houses that can easily be converted into six bedrooms. So what we've experienced in, in that area, not just Mission Viejo, but any of those master planned communities that have sprung up and really South County is, is kind of the, the, uh, the master planned community. I mean, Irvine's there, but at South County, they, there just seemed to be a little bit more land around it. So what we're seeing is expansion of homes, six bedrooms, and they're happening where you, they're taking over cul-de-sacs, um, and they're taking over neighborhoods and they're changing the fabric of neighborhoods. And I would say one of the things that we saw, and it really came up, how many things came up during the pandemic? How many things were exposed during the pandemic relative to people were monitoring what their kids were doing in school? We were home more. We were seeing what was happening in our neighborhood where maybe we weren't paying attention to that before because we're in our car, we're out the driveway and we're going to work and we're coming home. So people noticed a lot more. So what was happening in Mission Viejo prior to that, but really ramped up in 2020 and in the surrounding communities, was people were coming to our um, council meetings and they were mad. They were so upset because of what was happening in their neighborhoods. People were on the streets. They were pushed out of homes. They were going to wrong homes, similar to the experience that you just breaking in, thinking they were at the house that they were supposed to be at, but they weren't. They weren't in the right state of mind. They weren't being cared for. And this started to become very apparent. Now, we had no way of knowing where these homes were. And these are all the same problems as every other city. We are not unique. But what we decided to do was hold a town hall. And we said, come and speak to us. Well, it was overwhelming. And we brought lots of people to come and speak to them. But they wanted to share their stories. So we started recording their stories kind of as potential opportunities to share testimony with our state. Because we knew that this is where the lion's share of the power was to do some, some level of regulation or control would be coming from the state. And these are associated with licensed as well as unlicensed group homes. So it's, it's, it's both. So what we uh, did is we, we held a town hall and it grew. And then we thought, okay, we're going to, we're going to set up some sort of a round table and other cities wanted to join in. So it started out as South County and it expanded. So we've, we immediately, Santa Ana jumped in, Newport Beach was in very early, which so appreciated. And so it really did expand. And then on several of our calls, we've had people from outside Northern California, outskirts. Um, so, so it has spread. So we are gaining traction. And we've also had Terry Sforza with the Orange County Register, who is a dog on a bone. <laughs> you don't want to be on the wrong side of her. And we weren't. We were on the right side. Um, and she has been an amazing advocate and uh, reporter of all things that have been going on. She's even gone so far as to track some people that have been sent here from Florida and un almost trafficked yeah. for insurance purposes. And she's gone, and if you read her stories, you'll, you can, you can see what I'm talking about, um, where people are, the parents couldn't find them, and they, and one of these people was found in Los Angeles on Skid Row, and her handler would not let her go back to her parents. I mean, it's, so it's, it's so, trafficking. it is, well, young adults, yeah, right. I, I think, um, but I will leave that for you to read Terry's because I don't want to get too far from what we're trying to do. So what we try to do is collect information for our state representatives. We had at that time, Senator Pat Bates, who has introduced a lot of bills and has not got them through. I believe they go to the public safety in the assembly where good bills go to die. I understand that is the, the slogan yes. for this particular committee. So um, she came on, so I'm the co-chair. She was the original we were chair. Co we were co-chairs of this 
So we've since brought in um, Diane. Thank you so much for doing that, Kate Sanchez, um, we as as and also Lori Davies to just kind of come in and be. So the three assembly women in the south. Yes, in south in in this area. Yeah. yeah. So we so that has what has transpired. So it's built. It's it's um in it, it's just continued to grow. So let me. I have some notes because I kind of went off script. So <clears throat> this is called the California. We changed first. It was south county then it was orange county and we had to change the name within the first four months so now it's the california sober living and recovery task force we have residents that are impacted by uh, folks that live adjacent to them that are operating these homes on our task force so it's different than a lot of other task force where you just have electeds so we actually have residents on the task force which we think is really meaningful when it comes to talking about real life situations and what's going on and what we're trying to do is focus on the person that's trying to get recovery because we feel if and diane mentioned this but we feel in our neighborhoods if those people can be cared for properly the neighborhood will be okay and it should solve the issue of what is happening to neighborhoods with people in and out all hours of the night, not being monitored, roaming the streets, and sometimes getting booted because they broke the rules of the house potentially and that person put them, they're put out on the street. Now they become a homeless situation for our community and also a law enforcement situation. So the city of Mission Viejo took this on and I just wanna give huge kudos to Newport Beach, which has taken on a lot over the years as well as Costa Mesa and other cities because a lot of money has been spent by cities, millions and millions of dollars. I'm sure you all know this. So we thought, okay, well, we, it's our turn. We gotta, we gotta take it on. So that's what we did. And <clears throat> we're trying to just increase participation and influence across the region. So it, I just want to remind everybody in a recent Orange County Grand Jury report, the task force is really uniting fellow jurisdictions experiencing all the same challenges. Pooling our resources, sharing information, what's worked, how you got sued, what didn't, what you got sued. We're, we're doing appeal, we're helping with appeals, all kinds of things just to try to um, get everybody around the same table. So we, we listen to a lot of community feedback. We're doing a lot of recording of the experiences so that we have it on video so that we can share it as testimony. And we also have a list of people that are potential testifiers, witnesses, what do you call it? Yeah. Witnesses, sorry. Um, I'm not a lawyer. And, um, and to go to Sacramento, potentially, uh, when the time is right. Um, and just trying to tee that all up because that takes a lot of work. Um, we are uh, working collectively to some, at, enact some reforms that protect our neighborhoods and communities. And like I said, as well as those people that are suffering from the addiction or the illness, whatever that is. So some of the initiatives that we have done, um, have, have completed this year is uh, we provided some support as a task force and individual cities. We even encourage action from the individual cities for the uh, for Assembly Member Diane uh, Dixon's joint legislative audit committee. So we sent it there. We got a lot of support for that. Super and it's and it's uh, and it's called a JLAC. Right. Right. And so this is, is she gave you an update on that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But another thing that we did was an amicus brief for the support of the city of Costa Mesa's litigation involving sober living home ordinances, which really do, does have some far reaching implications. So we have been working to coordinate that as well. So <clears throat> just another point is. Um, it, so thank, in part to the ta support of the task force, the JLAC audit, you know, as, as was mentioned, is moving forward. And we hope that this will set the stage for some legislative reform. That's the goal at the state level, which is ultimately how, how we need to address this issue. And all of this work that we're doing around this, we're teeing up so that we can show up, we can have activists, mention the word activism, so we can have people that are testifying that are not just mad that that home is there and they make noise, but very specific examples that impact public safety. So we, and also the danger 
that it is to the person that's trying to get help. That is what we want to try to focus on because I think that's what works up there. Yeah. It's not about they don't care about you people in Newport Beach, no. you people. They think we're just, you know, Orange County whiners. Um, I know this is being recorded, probably not appropriate. <clears throat> but anyways, I'm just saying the truth. We're not whiners. <laughs> we're not whiners. We try to solve problems. So... Uh, then, you mentioned Katrina Foley, uh, the count, and the County of Orange have graciously, graciously agreed to host our next task force meeting. So we're going into the county seat in the building up there at the Hall of Administration on December 14th. Did you guys know that? I know. I'm, I'm excited about that. So the county's active participation, we feel, is uh, really a big milestone in the next steps for this task force in our efforts. Um, and on that note, we're expecting a representative from the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office to be in attendance and participate. So again, we're trying to bring everybody in because this goes across all lines. We are purposely not making this a political situation. Right. It's, it's not a us versus them, a philosophy versus this philosophy. It's protecting our neighborhood, our, our, our neighborhoods as well as these residents that are seeking help. Um, so I just want to say on the task force, um, all the articles from the Orange County Register that we have all of the information, a lot of documents is all available, all available at www.soberlivingtaskforce.com. So you can go to that and there's a lot of resources there and you can catch up all on all of this and any, any information we have, we we kind of create a hub there so that cities, residents, everybody can see what we're doing. And we actually are paying City of Mission Viejo right now, but we're going to see how that all plays out over this next few months, is right now solely footing the bill for the um, staff staffing that's doing the website, organizing, actually prepared me these talking points so I wouldn't forget anything, <laughs> and all those things because we want our city staff to focus on city staff stuff right. and taking care of our cities that we need things done. How's that for an intro? Great, excellent. Let me uh, before we get to uh, questions. Thank you, Wendy. You're uh, Let me just two points I want to bring up. The Department of so explain this. The Department of Social Services and the Department of Healthcare Services. We have recently realized, our, and City Attorney Aaron Harp discovered this probably, or just is nowhere dealing with this. There are two different rule, a set of rules and, and state codes. They don't talk to one another. Of course not. And part of the, hopefully, direction we want to go in as a legislative, another legislative solution aspect is how can we integrate the two codes or at least make them mirror image of one another. Yeah. So it's the, it's the distancing to prevent over concentration and it's the enforcement and it's the handling of complaints and all the accountability uh, aspects that any state agency should have. So we're looking into that. Also, I do want to say, I neglected to mention that we're, Cotty and I are working, we have an Orange County delegation of assemblymen and assembly members and state senators to get them all, we're all together on this. We'll have a meeting soon where she's organizing and she chairs it informally. And then we are going to make the request to the department head of DSS and DHCS to meet with us, to meet with the Orange County delegation to go through all of these issues. So uh, Connie did have, what year was that? Maybe 2021, when we had the, uh, she had, I think it was during COVID, it must have been 2020. It was a Zoom meeting with the Department of HCS and asked a lot of questions. She didn't have the audit request that I have, so it was not really documented, but it's on the record that she asked some questions and she clearly, Assembly member, member Cotty Petri Norris was not happy with how they were operating. And we're really building on the fact we've tried to get the agencies to be more responsive to, to the patients as well as the community and to clarify the administrative procedures. So we're doing the heavy lifting here. You're, you are managing the activism and, trying, and yeah. I'm trying and with my colleagues managing and, uh, the legislative solutions. Before we turn it over to questions, Erin, do you want to make any, why no, you don't want to make why any don't we, yeah, why, don't we, <laughs> why don't we take it, uh, uh, 
both of you have made wonderful presentations. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, very informative. I think uh, it's a great start in understanding comprehensively what's going on, not just here in the city of Newport Beach, but what's happening countywide and statewide. And we really appreciate you being here and, and starting this uh, conversation. Sure, we're happy to be here. Um, you did so well. You answered a lot of the questions that we had sent to us prior to you coming. <laughs> oh, over, all right. And okay. a lot of questions. I didn't prepared. have questions. Well, but I think that we need to maybe <laughs> dial it back a little bit because okay. a lot of, that was a lot of information in a very <clears throat> short period of time. And so maybe we can sort of um, delve a little more deeply into some of the issues that you talked about. For example, Diane, you just mentioned the um, sort of disconnect that we have between the social rehab and the drug and alcohol rehab and the distancing requirements that are really not being jointly applied. And what's happening is we're having even more severe concentration because each of those facilities can exist in the same neighborhood at this point and not be subject to the distancing that would be right. required of them, them individually. And that's a big problem. We already have over concentration in our community, as Wendy mentioned in her community mm -hmm. and communities countywide. So this idea that you mentioned about really exposing the directors or you know somebody that's senior level in each of those organizations, DSS and D, uh, HCS, to what's happening, boots on the ground what's happening, seems to be a good and novel approach. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the possibility of actually bringing the, those people to Newport Beach to see what's happening in our particular neighborhoods? Oh, and that, thank you for reminding that. We do want to bring them into a site visit to walk our neighborhoods and just see what kind of facilities, these quasi-institutional facilities that are really residential facilities that are, are providing treatment for people who desperately need treatment. Um, I, I will I mean, toss the ball to Aaron here because he's the one that really surfaced the problem that these two agencies are distinct in their uh, state code and there are no required distancing requirements now. So the, 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 so the Department of Social Services has taken the position that the law that says they have to be, uh, facilities have to be 300 feet away from each other, that that doesn't apply to DHCS facilities. So if you have one uh, Department of Social Services facility, um, you know, here, and a DHCS licensed facility 100 feet away, they have basically have taken the position that the 300-foot rule that says you can't put a facility that close together because it's over-concentration, um, they take the position that, well, we only have to pay attention to other Department of Social Services facilities. We don't have to pay attention to other state licensed facilities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Diane's really getting at is, mm -hmm. is that um, the the state laws need to kind of mirror each other. You need to have, and the, and the DHCS laws don't have any dis distancing requirements. So you want to have distancing requirements in each law. You want to firmly recognize that it applies to both types of state licensed facilities, that some don't get off the hook just because they're licensed by a different state agency. Um, we've taken the position, though, that it does apply. So the city of Newport Beach has taken the position that uh, a DSS facility cannot be within 300 feet of a DHCS facility. Um, and we think that's the appropriate interpretation of the law. And if it's not, then that's what the law should be. Well, yes. And do you want to opine on this question? I just recently thought of this, uh, just to follow up on your comments, that now the law, the state law, it's codified as new state law that uh, alcohol and drug addiction is now considered a mental illness. So technically, this is now under the jurisdiction of DSS, and so maybe they. This is going to force the issue. Well, I, I think there's a lot in those those new laws, and I think one of the important um, pieces of that is part of it's giving immunity to kind of healthcare providers to uh, institute holds on people who have you know severe alcohol problems and be able to hold them without being sued for it. So I think there's a lot to unpack with the new laws, yeah. but I definitely think that. Um, you know, this is an active area. We're seeing a lot of new legislation coming out and regarding it. But it, I think, from a community standpoint, um, I, what I see as one of the biggest issues is is this over concentration <laughs> and not being distanced far enough apart. Now, there are definitely a lot of other issues. Ultimately, we'd like to see uh, it re all return to local control so the city can license and permit these. But I think at the state level, if we had the distancing, it would solve a lot of problems. I agree. Thank you, Aaron. 
so we'll get to questions from the audience in just a couple minutes, just to talk a few more minutes about um, what's going on at the state level and, and also with the task force. Maybe, Wendy, I guess a question for you. You know, we are involved with the task force, and we're so grateful to you for um, bringing that opportunity to all of the cities in California in general, I guess, now that it's expanded so largely. Um, I think one of the important things for us to make note of is, is that we, you know, need to understand like really what reform are we looking for and on what timeline you know it is wonderful to pool information it's wonderful to have partners in um, organizing um, opportunities for the public to come and understand and that kind of thing but at the end of the day what we really need is change so what kind of change are we looking for and on what kind of a timeline well i think what we're going to do is we're going to be uh, tagging on to what comes out of this audit and we're going to formulate a piece of legislation as a task force working with our legislators. And that timeline is going to be over the course of 2024. Um, that's our goal. And what we're going to be doing at our next meeting is a step, and there's going to be an email coming out on ad hoc formation. So we're actually going to have a legislative task, a legislative task force as part of the one of our ad hocs. Um, Great. Uh, Yes. So we have some. So that is where we're coalescing to form the action points of our task force, and that's actually going to be happening at our um, at our next meeting. And I believe uh, on the legislative front, yeah, we're actually going to um, involve some of our legislative representatives. I think Diane is recommended for one of these, or her staff people. Hi. So um, when is so, the so when, so when our when does your task force meet? We meet quarterly, roughly quarterly. So um, the next one is December fourteenth. In where will it be? It will be at the county seat. Oh, that's right. And can anybody go? <clears throat> anybody can go to it. All right. Yes, and we can make sure that there's information on the Speak Up Newport That's website really that incorp that uh, allows the. Uh, That's people. really important because Katrina is an advocate. Yes, she is, and it would be a friendly audience. Yes, and, and all members of the board, or just Katrina, or yeah. well, uh, I know that Don Wagner, supervisor chair of the of the board of supervisors, yeah. has been sending representatives and is very supportive of this. Right. As a matter of fact, I think he introduced the county did some things to also try to help with the sober living from a county, yes. a sober living situation from right. a county level. It's at Katrina's in, in, so we're bringing you know. all of that together to formulate legislation and also best practices. So we're sharing best practices. Here's what worked at this city as a city ordinance. Here's what didn't. Here, we, here these people got sued, the, but this city hasn't been. So we're trying to do bring some of those type of action, interim actions to the task force as well and have recommendations out on our website for best practices. So um, that I would say from a timeline standpoint, we're getting into the act the um, actual action part now because we've coalesced we have our we have a good group of people and it's growing every month um, and now the task force we're gonna um, we're gonna be prepared so that when the study comes back we can use that along with the um, reports the audit reports that we've already we've uh, gotten from the grand jury right. so we can bring all of this together to support this piece of so legislation. So how can people here tonight, I mean, we should coalesce and have just one large working group of active citizens across Orange County. So how can they be- Go to that website, go to the website that I mentioned. And sign up. And sign up. And like I said, we'll add that to the Speak Up Newport program so that people have it. Soberlivingtaskforce.com. Yeah. Because I think we should be, all be coalesced together. And in fact, for the December 14th yes. meeting, Many of you can come, and that will be on the website. Yes. And just, I would suggest, I mean, all, and Newport Beach is part of, we're all part of this. No, and at, very active. Yeah, so you guys are, been, have been terrific. Guys, all so going, come together. Going back to something that actually the city attorney mentioned, you know, we seem to hear a lot about, um, you had mentioned Pat Bates. I know that um, there's been other legislators that have, proposed bills or proposed some sort of reform at the state level. And it seems like whenever it's related to permitting, it's rejected, vetoed, or just never makes it out of committee or, or that kind of thing. Um, 
another approach that would be not as good is actually bringing permitting back to local control, but the enforcement piece of it, the monitoring enforcement, because again, boots on the ground, we know what's happening here in our city. You guys and your staff know what's happening in Mission Viejo, and the, all the cities pretty much have residents like we have here today that understand what's happening on their streets in their communities. It's very difficult to translate that system-wide up to Sacramento and have some sort of meaningful enforcement come Agreed. back down. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a lot of idea about at least proposing more enforcement yes. back to the local, local jurisdictions. But here's, here's the issue that I learned from the city attorney over the years in Newport Beach. The enforcement has to be of the codes that exist for anyone. So if it's disturbing the peace or if it's noise making or... I don't know, smoking on a sidewalk? Is that the existing city municipal code? Well, that's what I'm saying is, yes, we can enforce our city code. Yeah, that's that's not an issue. That's never been You're the problem. The I'm talking about the licensing. When there's unlicensed operators, they, we have multiple um, resident communications that discuss violations of the actual... Right. Or, I don't know I, I'm, what I've heard. In, bringing and, that back here. And Aaron could speak to the unlicensed. I know that there have been pending applications for licensure, and then there's some have been operating, and then we have, the city of Newport Beach has reported that. Why don't you talk about local enforcement on licensing? Uh, so I, I think it's absolutely true that, that the state laws basically say that um, local entities need to treat these lo state licensed facilities that are six and under the same as we do any other residential home so that we don't have the ability to like craft special regulations right. that deal with the with this type of, uh, of use unless they're permitted by the city um, nobody comes to the city anymore to get permits because they can go to get a state license and avoid all the local regulation I, I think what what um, Rob was getting at is is we'd like to see more enforcement. If the state wants to license these, then the state should be enforcing the conditions of approval. Um, there's lots of state laws that basically say, you know, if you're licensed, you can't do X, Y, or Z, and the citizens file complaints with the state, and they either don't hear back from them, or there's no real enforcement right. taken. Um, and I think that's really where your audit's going, is like, you know, how, how are these laws being enforced? You know, when are they being revoked? You know, when are licenses being revoked? Um, if ever. And, and I th if ever, yeah, and I think that that's a lot of what you're, I, you're getting think into. I think we found that there's no enforcement of DHCS locally or did they get a new did they get any kind of human resources down here I think they were only in Sacramento like they're three yeah. enforcement officers and DSS it does have a number of people who do enforcement whatever enforcement there is here it, it's it's not really um, translating no. to change. Yeah. So I, I do see that there's a number of people in the audience, and we um, would, sure. would love to have people line up at the mic, and then we can ask questions for either or both. Turn on the mic. Don't forget this is being recorded, and it's a public meeting. Is that what it is? Okay, yeah. Um, how is this related to sort of the board and CARES? Is there any similarity or not, and how do you feel about those also in the community? Or does not matter? Well, I'll let the city attorney respond, but my knowledge, we the city does prohibit boarding homes in our municipal code. But the, not boarding homes, the, the board well, and care. Well, no, but that's as far as it, boarding homes are prohibited. As they're all over Newport Beach, they're all over Corona Del Mar. I personally just visited tons of them, and they are all over. Board and care? Oh, yeah. This is the biggest thing now in investments. I mean, it's unbelievable. Now, that's, yeah, un they're all in, right up here, right over here. There are tons of them. I went, I went they're they're to view unlicensed? them. Sorry? Are they licensed? So when you describe no the, describe what they are. They are, as you mentioned, as you mentioned six bedroom homes yep. that have one caregiver. It's a company, but it's basically investors who invest in real estate in Newport Beach, Corona Del Mar, Mission Viejo, Irvine, no, no, no. And maybe three people will go in. And it's a company, and they rent it out to somebody who comes and certifies these homes and then they bring in a caregiver and they take care of elderly people that are 
ready to die, basically. Sorry, Elder, these are not uh, right. uh, social. They're called room and board. They're called board and care. I mean, it's they're it's, they're it's elder, called board we and care. We allow those in Newport Beach. No. Are we in, can we enforce that? If there are they state licensed facilities? If you Google board and care, you're gonna get 300 of them in Orange County. So we if do not more. We do allow those in Mission Viejo, and they have not been a problem. Okay, no, I, that's my question. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying because when you say we do allow them, they're not. They haven't been a problem. Oh, they're they're elderly. Because yeah, yeah. quiet. Because I mean, yeah, they're, it's they're quiet. They're, I mean, they're, they're really, not driving around. Very in the night. rarely, to, but no to, cars. Yeah, but to me, this is a distinction as well because yeah. when you said they take over a whole cul-de-sac, yeah. well, this is prime. You know, we live in Newport Beach, right? Right. Do what? Do I want at the end of my street seven board and cares because investors want to invest? Not allowed in at Newport Beach, correct? We don't. Hasn't been an issue. Yeah. So and, you and say certainly, that certainly we could get back to a question yes. like that. Yeah, no, but I mean, I, I would, yeah. I really am curious about how it's dealt with on a policy I'll level. I'll leave it to the, uh, we'll, the council members. We'll be available Beach. afterwards. Yeah. To okay, talk more, we get more into depth on that. Okay. Thank you. All right, next, sir. Yeah. Oh, you did it. <laughs> I'm gonna have to ma'am you now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, my name is Steve McNally. I am on the Orange County Behavioral Health Advisory Board. Every county in the state has one statutorily, Welfare and Institution Code 5604.2. Uh, I'm speaking as an individual. So um, I'm on both sides of this equation because I know we need the beds. Uh, but what I haven't heard so far is the police activity at the homes that you want to shut down. And I think everybody in the state wants to shut down bad operators. It's just a different addiction, making money. Uh, but uh, so I, I think that's pretty clear. Um, but I would like to understand if they were good operators and you don't care if they're in your, in your neighborhood, are you okay with that? Well, if they're not causing problems. Okay, so yes. what I haven't heard anyone say tonight though is uh, people do recover in those locations. They are hiding homelessness in some places. Mm -hmm. um, it's more complicated to some degree um, because of the type of facilities and how they're licensed. So if it's, the when they, it's when the patients are not being supervised, right. not being treated, then they walk around and cause problems right. in the neighborhood. So That's where the if I was in a city's role or the county and the Department of Healthcare Services didn't fund the position, I would just fund it locally. And then I would do the audit they would normally do and you get it done. You would have the local government fund the state facility? No, the local, the auditing part. We've oh. been talking about this auditing yes. for years. Uh -huh. and, uh, it, the, and the workforce at the state and the county, you know, it's like 20, 30% open vacancy rates. So it's not gonna get easier. So if it's really a hot button, it's not so hard, hard to fund three or four positions and just get the audits done. But I'm not sure what your audit is. I'm sorry, what? Well, it's the state, the state. Like physically, like could you show me a link to what the audit looks like? Well, I, well the kinds of questions that we. Because it would be important because Oh, it's, because there are statutory, you here, know. Here's what, here's what, and, and Kristen uh, Valendi is my district office director, so she's brought some material, but the state auditor, these are some of the questions, will focus on how the facilities are licensed, certified, and enforced. It will also look at the over-concentration in residential neighborhoods and the effectiveness of patient care in these facilities. We've submitted a list of questions where we specifically ask responses to. And those questions are on the handout that I okay. that is in the back so, of the room. So on the police I, enforcement, we yeah. do keep track of that. And I didn't go into it, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. I, it, it's happening. Well, no, I, and I'm that not, is how I'm, we find out about all but this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not discounting that. Okay. But I think if you lead with that, you can lead with what assets that you do have. Mm. And um, I, can't, I don't think there's anyone that says they want bad operators. Sure, yeah. So, um, and the licensing would be more like, is the state's license, 
Because I have a list of all of them in the Orange County. What about the unlicensed ones? I have those too. You can pull them off the open data portal that Governor Newsom put together. So, so all of the unlicensed? Licensed, unlicensed. You have all of them? Yeah. I'd love to see that list. Yeah. Because we haven't been able to get it. Well, you just have to go to the California Open Data Portal. So anyway, I won't I won't take over the rest of the meeting. Yeah. But. So w w maybe you can reach out. Well, to are you, uh, what is your role, sir? Are you a concerned citizen? Are you involved in any facility? Or no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a citizen. He said uh, he was. He's he's with the governor. I am a citizen. Um, I am on a behavioral health advisory board oh, of county. Right. Every county in the state has one. In our county, it's 14 citizens, no contractors, one supervisor. Supervisor Foley was on it for a while. Um, now we have Supervisor Sarmiento. All 59 uh, counties, there's more than, because Berkeley also has. Well, you, I would encourage you to get involved with the uh, task force because you're a subject but I'd like to know what your, like my goal isn't to shut down. That's not our goal either. That's not our goal either. My goal is to figure out how to get the state more responsive yes. to the county. That's, that's exactly our goal. goal. That's our goal. And the county's more responsive to yes. the people. Yeah. That's I mean, it. I hope I didn't come across to sh as saying that we wanted to shut them no. down. Did no, no, did? but I just want to, it's very, it's important okay. to have a clarity of what we're trying to get to. We're trying to because, take care of the people because, and, and the is, neighborhood. And this is what the audit will reveal when the data gets collected. Are these people getting well? Are they, yeah. being, are, are they ultimately being a lot of them are going to be, uh, Beach City young kids on opiates. They'll be what? They're going to be the Beach City huh. kids on oxycotton and opiates. Well, that's there's what the reports from, show. So there's many people from other states. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much many. for your question. Mr. McDonnell, Are there more thank you. questions thank you. from yeah. the audience? Anyone else that would like to ask a question? No. So let's. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I, uh, my name is Mitchell Bradford. I live down in Peninsula Point. Uh, we live, I think, 25 feet away from the most recently licensed SRF at 1585 Miramar. And, uh, you know, so I'll say that my wife and 17-year-old daughter are not, you know, excited about it. But it's been licensed for three months. Nobody's been occupying it yet. Mm -hmm. And so, but what I keep hearing about it, and, you know, Bill Ann and I have had plenty of discussions about this. And I, I've been in a Bible study group with Rick Afable for many years. And if you don't know who Rick Afable is, he now, uh, his, it was his vision to start Be Well OC. I don't know how many oh, people are familiar yeah. with oh, Be sure. Well OC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be Well OC is actually a program that works. Mm -hmm. And the city of Newport Beach contracts with Be that, Well, that's right. Oh, yeah. And he says he's very familiar, you know, you know with the support that they get, there's no criticism of what they're doing. I mean, they have the emergency vans that go out and it, rather than the police showing yeah, up. Right. And so, and this is volunteers. So in his commentary, and I always get the sidebars from him, first of all, he refers to these facilities as rehab Rivieras. And he says, generally, they're not effective. So this right. is only coming from a guy who's, you know, not just a hospital administrator, but a geriatric surgeon as well. And a very kind man who's whose wife always has like 25 people at their house over Thanksgiving that he doesn't know because she's very caring. So they want to see people get all, get healthy. Well. That's why they created Be Well OC. Right. So all we keep talking about really is enforcement. But what he says, and I'll just read you a few notes. There's inadequate screening of the facilities that are created and who's running the facilities. What are their qualifications? What are their backgrounds? Yep. You know, the, the, the facility of Sarah Health, who is now going to run the facility behind our house, the lead person, the CEO, is a marriage and family therapist. And her primary practice now, she uses hypnotherapy as her primary practice. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure that's going to help when you're bipolar uh -huh. and you're in one of these facilities. He says, lack of criteria for admission into the facilities, insufficient oversight, no doctors. BYOC, they have doctors, and at BYOC, they also have rooms that when somebody has an episode, psychotic episode, they lock them in that room and don't let them out until there's a solution figured out by a psychiatrist. Uh, finally, patients with mild to moderate illness, he believes that, you know, there may be some success with these, but most of these facilities now that are approved under SRF, 
are 12 to 18 months. Their licenses are to hold people in there, keep people in there for 12 to 18 months. My mom called those mental hospitals. She didn't call well, it's those. the social rehabilitation. It's, correct, the SRFs, right. That's how they're all now licensed, but these people are coming or going you know, every few weeks to those things. And he finally says, no, doctor, uh, no doctors for patients requiring that level of care. And that, that comes from an expert, not me. And by the way, I, I'll try to figure out a way to get them onto the task force. Perfect, thank you. Because I think and we are need good more medical experts. Of course. I agree. We want these people to get well. Yeah, that's, yes. that's, 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 and that's what he says. If you talk about we don't want them in our neighborhood, no. it's not gonna work. No, that's need, not how we talk. We well. want them well, exactly. yeah. 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 Thank All right, you. next question. We're probably running out of time, but we have sir, time for one more question. One more. One last question. One more long question. <laughs> one, I know. <laughs> With a short answer. Can, I know you can be very short. <laughs> uh, hello, my uh, name is Bill Moore. I've been a resident here in Newport Beach for about uh, 27 years. And I just, I have experience in the area that this first lady was talking about. So I just want to bring some clarification. To, she threw a lot of things out there. First of all, I worked as an ombudsman for about three and a half years here in Newport Beach. Most of my responsibility is right here in Newport Beach. There are 14 six-bed facilities in Newport Beach. That's all. There's Atria, there's some other home stars, but there are 14 six-bed facilities. The number of incidents we had in the neighborhood is virtually nil. I think one of the problems here is with the drug rehab and alcohol. These people are more active and they're out and about and they can be uh, disturbing. But that's not true with these uh, elderly uh, six-bed facilities. And uh, so you're talking I do about agree with citizen. her that You're talking is, senior citizen. Pardon me? Elder care. Yeah, elder care. All right. And we've not heard, care. have so we had any complaints cares. about elder care? Yes. No, we never get complaints. No, we we're not focused on elder care. I know you're not, but <clears throat> she brought it up. So I just wanted to. All right. Yeah, Thank you, Bill. Clarify a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. So we are out of time. And this has been a wonderful dialogue and we greatly appreciate both of your input and being available to come here for the city. Maybe each of you would like to have a few last words before we... Well, I, I appreciate Wendy coming all the way up here from Mission Viejo. I, but I, I have a daytime <laughs> job. It's right up MacArthur. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> not to embarrass Wendy, but we have other issues in our cities related to housing and affordable housing in Rena. And just so you know, Wendy Bucknam was one of the challengers to the RENA number methodology system. And she's been working, continues to work on OCOG very actively on this. Yes. So she's, she's a housing expert on, on RENA. Um, I also, before I close, is Eric, did he, Eric leave? He, I saw him sneak out. Okay. I was just going to get back to him uh, because he worked for uh, Pat Bates. Yeah. And I just wanted to see, see if he had any final comments. Well, I just want to thank everyone just to know that this is beyond just a status update. This is a call to action. That And in fact, we made some notes here on what we're talking about in terms of call to action. Let me get my notes in front of me because it's multiple steps that we really need people to be activated. Let me see where it is. Okay. First got of, it. I got it. So first of all, these are my closing comments. Thank you, Ed and Speak of Newport. Thank you, Robin. Excellent moderation. All right. We need... You need to keep communicating with your elected officials, the more the merrier, please, because we need it documented. Mm -hmm. And I think it's best to send emails. And my, Kristen, where is Kristen? Oh, Kristen is my district director. She's located here in Newport Beach every day. Uh, and my address and contact information is back there. So please write me because it becomes a matter of public record on the official Diane Dixon Assembly website. So that's really important to record everybody's comments and awareness and outcry. That's what it's going to take to make change. And I, and being involved, you're all here. You, you've certainly been involved. We need to, this is a long journey that we are on and it's an activist journey and we're going to get loud about it, uh, as soon as we need to in January. Use the media, social media, raise your voice. Again, don't do be, please don't be disparaging of the people. We want the people to get well. And it's not about our communities. I, I Just stay away from that. Let's talk about getting in best facilities with sufficient care, adequate care, medical care uh, for people who need help. That's what we want. Send letters to the directors. All this is back here. The directors of both of the departments, Department of Healthcare Services and the Department of Social Services, carbon copy me, CC me, 
carbon copy. When we, I don't, that, nobody, that, nobody you just showed your age. Copy Does anybody know what a carbon copy is? And I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. I, didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I know what I meant, but most people don't know what a carbon copy is. Anyway, CC, CC, me and your state and all of the, every member of the state assembly and the state senator the start. I want people to say, Diane, what's going on in your district? Everybody's writing us about social rehabilitation facilities and, and recovery homes. We have got to get registering. We have to register community uh, outrage on all this. Keep the pressure on. Basically, enough is enough. We want people to get well. There is a plethora of all these homes being uh, converted in our neighborhoods that are not providing the adequate services, the non-institutional care that the state is now required that people who need help need to be in residential communities and they're not getting the kind of family-like environment that the state law requires. That is the issue. The state says people with mental illness or addictions must be in, in homes that resemble family living, that they'll get better if they live in a family environment. We, we want to make sure that that happens. So this is a call to action, everybody. Don't ever hesitate to call me or write me, but I want it documented because this is going to add to the stack of records that we're keeping. So Thank go ahead, you, Diane. Okay, so, Wendy. so I will keep mine very short. So we're looking for examples of um, situations that you have in your neighborhoods as residents of, of a home that is not caring for the residents properly with, with specific examples. Because that is what we want to focus on, is, is really improving that and making sure that people are on their way to recovery. These are called sober living recovery homes. So we're really going to emphasize on the recovery issue. Um, you can sign up for our information and you can also, there's also a place where you can uh, see a link or a request to give a uh, testimony to what your, per, your specific experience on your, in your neighborhood at soberlivingtaskforce.com, which you had mentioned you're going to send that out. So I leave you with that because that's how you're going to do the activism part of this in addition to the letter writing yeah. as well. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Speak Up Newport. Thank you, Aaron, for being here. I appreciate the subject matter legal expert. And thank you, council members. Thank Robin Grant. Thank you so much, both of you. Some we'll of this you is in your hands now. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. We're going to make it happen. All right. Thank you so much. Ed, did you want to say any final words? All right, we're going to be dark in December, uh, but we'll have our next program in January, so watch out for the announcements for that, and have a happy holiday season. Happy holidays.